Hey there, e-commerce enthusiasts. Let me tell you about a game changer in shipping, ShipStation. It's the ultimate platform for simplifying your shipping process. With ShipStation, you can easily import, manage, and ship your orders in no time. It integrates seamlessly with your favorite e-commerce platforms and carriers, ensuring a smooth workflow. Gain valuable insights with their powerful analytics and reporting tools. Say goodbye to shipping headaches. Visit milwaukeemafia.com slash ship and level up your shipping game today. You're listening to Milwaukee Mafia, your weekly podcast dose of Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history. Hey everybody, welcome back to Milwaukee Mafia. This is Eric Walterkins. I'm Gavin Schmidt. And we're back with another episode. Gavin, what do you got for us today? All right, so, <laughs> woo, right off the bat, uh, I got a, I got a one I'm calling a mixed bag of booze and murder. Nice. Yeah. So, I just want to clear this up. This, what you're going to hear today, are things that were cut from the original Milwaukee Mafia book, and the main reason they were cut was for space, but. <laughs> Some of it also was the reason that when I had to cut for space, I was like, well, what what can I cut? And this one got cut because it doesn't all flow together very well. So by the time I get to the end of it, you're going to be like, that isn't even one story. That's like three <laughs> stories. So so you're getting three stories for the price of one. Right. Right. Now, so. right. so it's a mixed bag of booze and murder because it's a little bit of. It's a little bit all over the place this this time, which really isn't that unusual for me. I'm always all over the place, but so in my confession, I have to admit that I have never read the Milwaukee Mafia book. No, really. So my oh. question for this is: Is this because we've reached the end of the Milwaukee Mafia no. book that we're doing this, or this just seemed to be the logical place to put? No, these we stories? are. This well, I'm going in in timeline order. So this was just a. Uh, where is this now? Like the 30s, the 40s, somewhere in there? We were in the 40s. Okay, we were. Then, then we're probably about the 40s. Okay. I know the next time, the one I have for next week is the 40s for sure. So. All right, well, kick them off. Let's see what, let's see here some bur- booze and murders. Okay. So anybody who's been paying attention at this point should know that early on, the mob boss in Milwaukee was Vito Guadalabene, and then his son kind of took over. Well, after the Court of Benes, we got another mob boss. This guy's name is Joe Valone. Now, Joe Valone was actually not born in Santa Flavia like most of these guys. He was born in Pritzi, which is a, kind of the same area of Sicily. He comes to the U.S. He takes up work as a Milwaukee laborer um, through the Court of Bene brothers, because that's how he got hired on with the, as, for the city. For a while, he boarded in a home with other Pritzi na- natives, Apparently, this was kind of what you did when you came over. You lived with a bunch of guys from the same town, whether you knew them or not, because everybody just was cool with their own townspeople. So uh, the people that he lived with were Pesquale Miliocho, uh, which don't try to spell that, okay. <laughs> and and Joe Badamy. So we're going to kind of tell a story about Joe Badamy first, going back for this one. Hasso Pestalozzi, and I'm probably messing that, <laughs> that up. That sounds like you murdered that name. Probably did. <laughs> probably did. He is the school truancy officer. In 1912, he says, If the decent element in the third ward would clean out a small gang of cowards who are causing trouble, we wouldn't have any more of these outrages. If police would clean out about 15 liters, outrages would stop immediately. So he's just kind of speaking in general here that, like, the third ward is getting a bad rap. But he's like, it's just a couple of these guys. Just get them out of there. Railroad worker Pat Ferreira was found dead in July 1917 at home on Van Buren Street. His throat was slashed in four places and his arm was cut too. A wound on his neck was 14 centimeters long. A razor was in his hand, and a considerable quantity of blood was in his bed. Blood was puddled on the kitchen floor, and the house was disordered. His daughter said, Papa and Mama had some trouble last night, (laughs) and he has not had supper at home for the last two nights. Doctor said the wound could not be self-inflicted. Captain John Sullivan of the police believed it was suicide. 
We came to no other conclusion than that Ferreira committed suicide, he said. We questioned witnesses. You like this ambiance we got in the yeah. background? I don't know if people can hear that, but there's sirens in the back. We questioned witnesses, and Joe Badami insisted that he saw Ferreira draw the razor across his throat. Badami's story is corroborated by other witnesses. Ferreira had a temper and quarreled with his wife over money. He accused his wife of spending too freely. He was in debt and striving to make enough to cancel the obligation. His wife and Badami say that he attempted to kill himself before. Following Ferreira's death, Pestalozzi, the truancy officer, again speaks to the media. Why, why are they talking to this truancy <laughs> officer all the time? I don't know. He goes forward and he goes, Only breaking up the congested conditions in the third ward will prevent violence. It is not uncommon to find a family living in two rooms or even one. Authorities should condemn the shanties, forcing inhabitants to move elsewhere. He attributed Fer- Ferrer's death to quarrels among the leaders in the Italian community, who he refused to name, and said that the underlying problem was immigration. So is this the same guy that just earlier said, all we need to do is get out a few bad elements and yeah. all the problems? So, I mean, he's just kind of like <clears throat> I mean, changing his course of uh, his solution from period to period, basically. Yeah, but I mean, he's not hes not changing it that much. I mean, he's... Well, now he's saying that it's because they all live to get they live in such close quarters, right? I right. Mean, that's pretty different than just having to eliminate one small, a couple people from from the third ward, and the third ward would be fine. That's true. That's true. Kind of hypocritical, I guess. Pestalozzi goes on. This is a little bit of a longer quote here. <clears throat> I've never known a case where a lad brought up in America was the cause of an intrigue. It's always those who have come over bringing an inherited fear of police. Often the go-between does not play fair and receives a stab in the back as consequence. In Milwaukee, there's a large criminal class due to the fact that the Italian government, before the United States laid down its stringent immigration laws, sent to America only the lowest people. They are carrying out the principles of their forefathers and doing their own punishing, and they mistrust police as much as they did in Italy. In America, the majority are still in their own colonies and retain the customs of their native land. By segregating them, there will be a better chance of compelling them to the American way of living. So now, now my next question, and this is probably just shows how little I know, Mm -hmm. isn't that what every country was doing in the United States, sending to the United States at that time? Like they're saying Italy was just sending their criminals, but wasn't that pretty common thing for all countries to do um sure i, I mean guess i mean it's not always not it's no. not always criminals but but usually but, you you come here because you're in a crappy situation yeah 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 i guess yeah not criminals but but it's not certainly the rich people that are like relocating right. to right to the the new world right per se well so there's two things about this quote um one I mean, this is over a hundred years ago, and he could have said this last week. Like this is, <laughs> people still say this the same exact thing. Um, but the part that I find really interesting is Hasso Pestalozzi is an Italian immigrant. <laughs> he was born in Italy, and he came to America. So all this stuff he's saying about the Italian immigrants, it's like, but he's, not, but not me, but not me. I'm the exception. But yeah, this is what. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. So he's like, he's just crapping on his own people. <laughs> At the coroner's inquest, Badami testified that the blood on the kitchen floor was actually his. He got it while he was trying to take the razor away from Ferreira, who was naked and in a daze. He had known Ferreira for three years, and they had bonded and become friends. But Ferreira was unstable and had previously stabbed himself in the chest, and he would occasionally bite himself. Ferreira and his wife would fight over her cooking, and he beat her. When Badami heard Ferreira groaning like a bulldog the night of his death, he had no idea what he might see when he turned on the lamp. Doctors testified that suicide was very unlikely due to the nature of the wounds, but admitted, well, it's possible if he was in a frenzy at the time, and the coroner ruled the death a suicide. <laughs> so I, I, it could go either way. I mean, take, take your pick. No. So, okay, going back now. This is part two. Remember, this is multiple stories here. Uh, Joe Valone, again, our new mob boss, 
And his former boarder friend who was living with him, his roommate, uh, Pet Miliocho, started up Miliocho and Valone Wholesale Grocers. Miliocho was close to the Guardalabene family, just like Valone was. Pete Guardalabene had been his best man when he got married, and he was also his witness when he got naturalized, when he became a citizen. The grocery business was successful and was a way to employ young mob members. Miliocho was also involved with liquor manufacturing from his home. We know this because in 1926, a still in his house burst into flames, causing over $2,000 in damage, or $27,000 in damage today. So you said that they use this grocery wholesale business to employ mob members. Yes. Is that just kind of as a front to make it look like they're legit? Well, they are legit. Well, yeah, the company is legit, but is that why they would have done that? To to give these mob members a legitimate job that if somebody were to come to them and say, you're a mob member, you can be like, no, I just work for this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, keep in mind, I mean, most mob members are not making tons of money. Like, the reality is, is is this is not, you know... Being in the mob is not hugely profitable for most guys. Yeah, that's right, and we discussed this that that a lot of these guys actually did have jobs, so it, this was just something they kind of did. Hey, yeah. You know. So this was something they could do, um, being like the city city laborer was something they could do. Um, later on, being a bartender is like the most common thing you can do. So there's there's things that you do that you actually get paid for. There's other things that they do called no-show jobs where they're on the payroll, but they don't actually show up. Um, But I'm I'm assuming, in this case, the guy actually works there. Uh, And the example is a guy named Nick Fucarino. Uh, And I may be saying that wrong. It may be Fucarino. It may be Fucarino. Um, (laughs) I'm not sure. It doesn't sound great either way. Uh, Some of the family changed their name to... Uh, changed the C to a G, so it was Fuggerino. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a whole lot better, but it's. Uh, and for those out there who that is their name, I apologize, <laughs> but it just it doesn't look good. Um, anyway, so he moves to Milwaukee. He lived in Omaha for a while, of all places, Omaha, Nebraska, and he takes up work at the grocery store. Joe Valone, the mob boss, his wife. Also happened to be a Fucarino, so maybe they were in-laws. Maybe they were related somehow. Couldn't quite figure it out, but who knows. Fucarino was also born in Pritzi, <clears throat> and he went to live with his uncle in Omaha. He was arrested in Omaha in 1919 for vagrancy, pimping, and assault with intent to kill. He struck the mayor over the head with a gun during a riot. He was held on $10,000 bond, but was somehow released, and then he moved to Milwaukee. So, um, don't don't hit the mayor over that with a gun. (laughs) That's a no-no. While in Milwaukee, not only does he work at the grocery store, but he gets into the booze business, like you do. Agents raided a house on Jefferson Street. From there, they chased a car and caught up with Fucarino. In his car was 75 gallons of alcohol and a 33 revolver. The prosecutor requested bail of $8,000, which today is $107,000. The defense said, this is ridiculous. But then the prosecutor explained his reasoning. We are convinced that this man is but the pawn of others of powerful influence who furnish the $15,000 necessary to build and operate this big plant that the agents found. Additional information gathered by the agents since the capture of this man gives us a good line of the entire situation and may prove some connection with two or three other plants. He is not a citizen of this country, and he has no ties here. There's no reason why he should not jump bail if he wished and allow the bigger fry to escape. The judge said, okay, well, I'm not going to put it at 8000 but I'll put the bail at 2500 which he was able to pay. The trial continued for months, and Fucarino tried to throw them off the trail by saying that a wealthy man from Chicago, who he would not name, was financing him. 
Um, they were not able to find this unnamed wealthy Chicago man, and the case just kind of fell apart. Even though in the last episode, I want, want to point out that everybody was going to jail for everything in this this episode, we're back to not being able to find anything to get the person on. So That's true. That's true. So now we're going to go to a third part of the story, unrelated again to these other parts of the story. These, so all kinds of bits and pieces this time. We're going to start back in 1910. We're going back again. We're all wow. over the place. This time, I know, I hope people are paying attention. I'm trying to be not as confusing as I am sometimes, but... I have to jump around for these stories to kind of make sense sometimes. August 1910. Saloon keeper Leonardo Lafredo, and sorry again if Lafredo, Lafredo, if I'm saying that terribly wrong, he was at his tavern at 300 Bishop early in the day. It's interesting that he worked at 300 Bishop because this was the same tavern where Italian anarchists hang, hung out and these were the anarchists that allegedly blew up the police station uh, in 1919. So I do recall that yep. when we talked about that. Yeah, which we never really talked about in detail, but it I'm comes up in passing sometimes. Later in the day, Lafredo was shot three times with a 32 and killed almost instantly. He had three bullet wounds, which makes sense if he was shot three times, including one on the top of his head, and he died of a brain hemorrhage. Lafredo's nephew stole the gun away from the slayer, and beat him unconscious. That man, Tony Basil, was taken in, arrested, but found not guilty. <laughs> How? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. How did this fight begin? It began after Basil hit Leonardo's, Leonardo's son with a fishing pole, and Lafredo confronted him about the incident. Basil had beat both his own son and Lafredo's son with the pole, which had irritated Lafredo. Leonardo said, if you have any trouble with my boy, why don't you take it up with me? After being warned not to come any closer, the intoxicated Lafredo ignored Basil and called him, apologize for the language, a son of a whore. Basil's wife told Lafredo to let it go, telling him, there will be trouble if you don't let it go. Lafredo again ignored the warning, stepped forward, and took the shots. So I, I guess he's not guilty because they warned him that he was going to get shot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, yeah. I don't think that would work anymore. Probably oh, well, not. you told him you were going to shoot him before you shot him, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fast forward. We drove from 1910 all the way up to 1931. Whoa. Going way ahead. Leonardo, the man who's just been killed, he has some kids. One of his kids is a man named John Lafredo, who goes by Cross-Eyed Jack. Cool name. Yeah, Cross-Eyed Jack. It's a cool name. He's having a drink at a pool hall. While pouring a glass of wine and soda, a delicious spritzer, in walks Joe Paulo, who's known as Dago Pete. Sometimes Dago Pete appears in the newspaper as the bad man of Bayview. Wow. This guy's got some cool names. <laughs> yeah. Dago Pete operated a roadhouse by Cudahy. <clears throat> Lafredo said hello to Pete, and he shared a few drinks with the various men who were present in the pool hall. But soon the small talk erupted into an argument over tribute money that Pete thought that Lafredo owed him. Pete said that if he was not paid $300, he would turn Lafredo into the feds for operating a still. Lafredo told Pete he had no money with him and that Pete would have to go knock off the still to get his cut. Lafredo left the establishment and drove off in the snow. Only a block away, a freight train blocked the road, so he made a U-turn back past the building. Pete was outside and yelled, again, sorry about the language, You cocksucker, I'll blow your head off. Dago Pete fired his forty five at the car, shattering the windshield, and a gunfight broke out. Moments later, Lafredo drove away, and Pete was dead with three shots to the chest. Lafredo's stepfather told police that he was there, but he did not know who shot Pete. <clears throat> and this was over $300. Yes. Lafredo fled, causing sheriffs from six different counties to start looking for him. While searching, police uncovered seven stills and made six arrests. They found two... 200 gallon copper stills, 45 50 gallon barrels of mash, 
2,200 pounds of corn sugar and 30 gallons of whiskey. Police next discovered a still that was 14 inches by 24 feet, which extended from the basement of a house through a bedroom and up into the attic. Wow. (laughs) They destroyed five different vats that could each hold 2,500 gallons of mash. There was a 30-gallon barrel of alcohol and 14 one-gallon cans of alcohol at the site. In Lafredo's house, they found four different 200-gallon stills, as well as 100 gallons of whiskey and raw alcohol. Uh, A lot of numbers there, but the (laughs) point being is Lafredo is making a lot of booze. (laughs) No. I know we've gone over this, but when did Prohibition end? 33. So, okay, so we're so actually just before it the ended end of now. Prohibition. Yeah. I'm like, a... I'm like, I can't imagine. Because I was just trying to think if Prohibition's over, what are they? I mean, what can they really arrest them for? Right? Uh, yeah. After Prohibition, you probably can make alcohol freely, right? As long as you're not selling it. Yeah, as yeah. long as you're not selling it, which I would have to prove that he, they were selling it before. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Even though you have a, a still that's the right. size of a house. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, you know how that works. Once yeah. you have enough of something, they're assuming it, you're selling it. Yeah. Um, otherwise, this guy's got enough to drink for a couple of lifetimes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, Lafredo knows he's in trouble. Um, he actually talks to Mike Vitucci, who, if you remember way back when, Mike Vitucci is like the good guy leader in the Italian community. He's like the opposite of the mob boss. And he's like, yeah, you should probably turn yourself in. Lafredo's like, oh, Mike Fatucci, I respect you. Okay. So Lafredo turns himself in, and he claims that Pete fired the first shot, and his actions were in self-defense. He only shot because he was scared. And he fled because he was scared. And he left behind his wife and infant son, which he would have never done otherwise. Lafredo was charged with carrying a concealed weapon and second-degree murder which had a maximum penalty of 25 years in prison. Bail was set at $10,000. Prosecutor says, There is no doubt that witnesses lied about some things. Their stories do not jibe, and we have evidence that leads us to believe a second-degree murder charge can be successfully pressed, despite the self-defense that he claims. At the trial, the government's star witness was George Steffen, a railroad employee. Putting a hole in Alfredo's story, Steffen said, There were no freight trains passing by at that time. There's no way that you got stopped by a freight train and had to do a U-turn because we didn't have any freight trains out there. I'm a freight train guy. I know these things. There's no freight train. <laughs> so so he, he is that suggesting that he just stopped and turned around because he had the intention of going back and shooting the guy? Maybe. But the point being is that this original version of the story that he was trying to drive away and he had to drive back past the tavern. Well... Could suggest that could, he might could not, not have be ever, accurate. Yeah, and he might not have ever even driven away. He might the gunfire might have just started right then and there. Yeah, his stepfather also admitted on the stand that he lied to police when he said that he did not know who shot Pete. He's like, "Yeah, it was my stepson." <laughs> <laughs> police testified that they found no glass at the crime scene from Lafredo's car, so they didn't even know if the story about his windshield getting shot out was true. Even if Lafredo had acted in self-defense, he was less than honest about what had actually happened. Coming to the aid of the defense, surprisingly, was the coroner. He found a bullet embedded in a porch across the street from the pool hall, and a test showed that its markings matched up with Pete's gun. So they know that Pete fired at least once. The bullet was actually found after the trial already began. So it was a surprise for the prosecution, who did not know it existed. In the DA's closing argument, he says, Pete was put on the spot. Does the law of self-defense apply to gangsters? Are we going to allow gangsters to shoot it out and then free them when they claim self-defense? Which is a fair point. Yeah. I mean, if two, so. if two guys are both going to start shooting at each other and the one who survives was like, what well, was self-defense? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, then people could just shoot at each other all the time. Yeah, I mean. That's not really a great strategy. The jury deliberated for 31 hours. Wow. The judge dismissed them for the night and said, if you don't have a verdict in the morning, we're going to just call this whole thing off. While they were out, Lefredo was free on bond and he spent his time at the pool hall. The jury remained out a total of 41 hours and 20 minutes, but they did come back with a verdict the next morning. Guilty of murder in the second degree. Lefredo was disappointed. They might as well have called it first degree murder, he said. I'm not a racketeer. I've lived here nearly all my life and I'm a good citizen. 
Them farmers may think it's murder, but that doesn't alter the facts. Lafredo was sentenced to 16 years in prison. When asked if he had anything to say, he stuck his thumbs in his vest pockets and asked if he should have been a human target. The judge responded that he should be grateful that the jury let him off easy. He could have got 25 years. Even if he had beaten the charges, he would have been referred to the feds for all the stills that were found. Strangely enough, during the trial, Pete's wife was in the courtroom sitting with Pete's mistress, and they they comforted and hugged each other as they heard the verdict. So I uh, don't know what's going on there, but that's a whole other story. Lafredo was allowed to say goodbye to his wife and kids. His second son was only three weeks old when he went off to prison. And what did he get? Six, 16 years. 16 years. And he could have gotten 25. Could have got 25. How many years did he actually spend in prison? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> he gets out after three years. Wow. <laughs> uh, he, asked, uh, he asked the DA, you know, hey, uh, could you, can you help get me out of here? And the DA is like, okay. And he writes a letter to the governor, and he says, it's possible it was self-defense. I mean, maybe. So he ends up getting pardoned after only three years. So, not too bad. Killing a guy, getting three years. Please tell me he came out of prison and didn't do anything else. Like, you just lost track of him. He disappeared. I lost track of him. Oh, yes. He just disappeared. <laughs> and this is the 1930s, and I will tell you this. Jack Lafredo lived a long, full, happy life. He passed away in 1982. Wow. So he made it almost another 50 years and, without and being a bad guy. Without being arrested for anything. So, yeah. Well, once again, comes back to the theory he could have a, been either a really good criminal or given up the criminal life. Right. So. Right. I mean, other than the shooting incident, which, I mean... You should not be shooting people, but, but I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe it really was self-defense. Um, I mean, the guy is a big time bootlegger, but, but then again, everybody was a big boot, time bootlegger. bootlegger back then. Yeah. Like, that wasn't, I mean, as far as it was a crime, but it was one of those crimes that was like, yeah, you know, yeah. Not, Most people didn't think of you as being a terrible person because of it. Yeah. Mob boss Joe Valone also had his own, uh, little prohibition problems. In June 1932, he's arrested with a variety of men on charges of conspiracy to violate the liquor laws. A total of 45 people were wanted, including at least 10 from Milwaukee, for a bootleg ring that allegedly stretched as far as South Dakota. The ring had been operating since 1928, so that's four years, and had a fleet of trucks hauling its cargo, as discovered in records found at a raided realty office, at a real estate office, in downtown Milwaukee. Their largest distillery was operating in Baraboo and was destroyed. Working with Valone on this was a county supervisor candidate named Angelo Guadalabene, who is another Guadalabene brother. Well, I shouldn't say another one, but he's a Guadalabene brother. <laughs> also working with them was fight promoter Al Tusa and a man named Joe Dominic. Joe Dominic ran Dominic Wholesale Grocery, huh? which was at 1414 Elbert Street in Racine, which, if you can remember back to the Racine episode, this is almost the exact same location where that shooting was in Racine at that time. So we can throw back to the Racine, Racine episode. episode. But again, so we got at least two guys here in the wholesale grocery business, which, you know, the reason you do that is because you... You get your sugar and you get your other supplies. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you, you know, you should have said that from the beginning because that makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Easy way to get the supplies you need to create your make your alcohol. Yeah. So fight promoter Tusa said to the press, I can't understand it. I've never been in the racket, never been in any kind of trouble. This whole thing is hurting my family and my business. Joe Valone, mob boss, claimed that his only connection to the liquor business was that he sold sugar. But he didn't even know who his customers were. Oh, well, he knew who his customers were, but he didn't know what his customers were using it for. You know, he didn't know what kind of customers they were. Following a grand jury, more people were charged, including a man named Jack Phillips, who I don't know anything about, except that the newspaper always called him a well-dressed man about town. I don't know what that means, but Jack Phillips, well-dressed man about town. Uh, 
and hop salesman Sam Holzman. Not surprising that a hop salesman would be involved in the booze <laughs> business. A well-dressed man about town, Jack Phillips, had a history of bribing police and drunk driving. I guess the skill of bribing police comes in usefulness yeah. when you're drunk driving yeah. all the time. 30 of the original suspects were brought to trial in federal court in Madison. Agents testified that, quote, the syndicate transported thousands of gallons of alcohol between Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota, including approximately 3,000 gallons every month between just Milwaukee and Madison. All those who appeared pleaded not guilty. Some of the defendants were still at large. The whole situation amounted to very little as the public's interest in prosecuting bootleggers had decreased. Prohibition was on the way out, and everybody knew it. Most of the defendants, including Joe Valone, ended up having charges dismissed, or they paid fines that were even less than their bond, so, you know, they already had basically paid their fine. Fight promoter Al Tusa paid $1,000. Angela Gordalabeni paid only $500. Uh, Some other guys were put on probation for six months. Other people had charges dropped, blah, 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 blah. A second liquor conspiracy trial started later on, but only two of the guys came back, one of them being Altusa. The claims were reduced to the allegation that they conspired to ship alcohol across state lines without the proper labels, which is a pretty technical charge. This time, the alcohol was claimed to be at least 48,000 gallons, valued at $250,000, or $4.2 million worth of alcohol in today's money. But again, the charges were ultimately dismissed. That's incredible that big of a shipment and they're dismissing their charges. That's just how much they stopped caring about booze by the end, you know, by the 30s. In in the 30s, thir- would you have said, would, and you probably don't know this, but in the 30s, because you've mentioned over and over that they were crossing state lines when they when they were making this alcohol. Sure. Do you think in the 30s, did you have to be crossing state lines to have anything happen to you because... Like local law enforcement just didn't care enough to hmm. to do anything about it. Good question. Um, I wouldn't say that you'd have to. I mean, if you get raided by the feds, you get raided by the feds. But um, yeah, de- but definitely, definitely, if you're uh, transporting across lines or a significant difference, they have a better case mm-hmm. because. Um, well, and I th- there, there's they're... a lot of loopholes in, in the prohibition law. I mean, you could own booze. It wasn't illegal to own booze. If nope. you if you if you had before prohibition began, if you stockpiled booze and you drank that booze during prohibition, well, you didn't break any laws. Was it illegal to create your own booze for your own consumption? Yeah, it, you know, if if it was in small enough amounts that they didn't think you were selling it, you were you were probably okay. But that's but when you got it loaded up in trucks and you're driving around, <laughs> the, yeah. I think they can make a reasonable assumption that you're selling it. When, when you have a house size still, yeah. <laughs> so, um, no, you didn't. You wouldn't have had to cross state lines. But I think that would kind of that would kind of tip them off that you weren't just driving around with your personal stash <laughs> of alcohol. <laughs> but basically, by the 30s, it was really the, only the federal yes government that was really even trying to enforce these rules correct basically correct at least in wisconsin it might have been different in other states but even in other states by this like so wisconsin was more lenient than most by the mid-20s wisconsin loosens its laws where they basically tell the police not to turn people in anymore but prohibition ends in 33 but already by like i don't know the exact year but let's say 1930 roughly Mm -hmm. i mean even the federal government starts relaxing it and you could start making like really low, low alcohol, like just barely above well, non-alcoholic alcohol, you know, beer. So they were even being like, eh, you know, we never really had a problem with beer. It was the whiskey we didn't like. So let's kind of phase this back in. So, um, yeah, even the feds were kind of, they they knew that things weren't working out. The only other tri- time that Valone, Joe Valone gets in trouble is during World War II, when him and his business partner, Pat Miliocho, were sued by the Office of Price Administration, the OPA. The OPA says that they were selling their sugar for overselling prices. The agency demanded that they be fined or asked to be awarded damages of three times the amount overcharged. That's the only other time he got in trouble. And this was actually really common. 
Um, I think we may have mentioned this previously, but if not, uh, well, either way. During World War II, the government rationed the hell out of shit. Uh, I mean, stuff. Rationed the hell out of stuff. And and uh, things like sugar, gasoline, and things like that, you needed coupon books for. Okay. So uh, if you were a sugar supplier, like, you were supposed to have, like, set prices. The government was very strict on what you could and couldn't charge. So basically, they were saying, because we're rationing these items, we don't want you to overinflate the price. Right. And, and only the rich can get it or something like that because... Exactly. Because it is such a rare thing to get a hold of. Exactly. Basically. So they, they were essentially accused of price gouging because there was a sugar shortage, which, you know, in the normal market, when there's a shortage, you raise your prices. But... This is World War II, and they're like, yeah, you can't really do that. Yeah, we're going to make sure you don't do that because, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, sugar was in short supply because guess what? All the sugar farmers are over in Europe. <laughs> so right. they're like, this is, you know, this is nobody's fault. <laughs> yeah. But that's the only other time he gets in trouble. Um, and next week, uh, it's going to be, we're going to actually have a coherent story. A coherent story. Yeah, one beginning to end, <laughs> where it's does. all one topic, and it and it doesn't bounce around. Doesn't go- bounce around. Doesn't really. I mean, it it covers some time periods, but all in order. I'm curious. So you talked about. So this is kind of. I think the first I've really heard a lot about Joe Valone. It is. It's probably the first time you've heard about Joe Valone. So, and being that he's a mob boss, I'm curious. Was Joe Valone a mob boss? And it. Was he just kind of an era of mob boss that wasn't really significant or important? Time yeah. Time of the mafia? Yeah. That, like, are we going to hear more about Joe Valone, or is this pretty much Joe Valone? This is pretty much it. Now, um, that is a great question. I actually thank you for asking that question. Okay, so in the history of the Milwaukee Mafia, I mean, there are several mob bosses, but it's weird because there's... There's a stretch where there's it's really not they're either not very important or it's not well documented. I'm not sure which. But we start out Vito Guarda Labene, he's always like in the paper. Anytime someone's in trouble, they're like, Oh, it's you know, Vito and his guys. And then his son kind of got, becomes a part of that. But there's other guys in between. Like even between the Guarda Labenes and Joe Valone, there's actually another guy named Amato who we're not even gonna talk about. Because he never comes up. Then there's Joe Valone, and this is pretty much the extent of what he comes up in. Um, there's another guy named Sam Ferreira, who we'll probably mention, but really only in passing. There's John Alioto, who we will actually talk about. He's got his own episode coming up. Sneak peek. Might be a month away, but he's coming. And then the really big attention comes when Frank Balistrieri comes in. And basically, one, because he's a huge media hound. But two, I mean, he's the boss for 30 years, so it's a big freaking deal. But, yeah, but there is this, this between, like, the Guadalabenes and the Balistrieri family, it just, we know who the mob bosses are, but they didn't get the news attention. And I don't know why. I, I couldn't tell you the reason for that. And, uh, well, and this is, I don't know. But this is pure speculation, so tell me if I could be onto something here with this. Okay. Does so the Guarda Labenes they kind of do the prohibition phase and all that sure. stuff like that, which was a huge thing for the mafia. Do the Balistrieri's are they the kind of responsible for the Vegas years? They are. So, so maybe we're just kind of in the middle. We're in a law where the mafia just doesn't really have a big industry that they're hitting hard and making news with because. I mean, isn't okay. isn't prohibition and isn't Vegas the two big things that Milwaukee Mafia yeah made money doing? Well, you know, basically. maybe maybe that's it. Maybe it's as simple as that. Just those two big things. Because yeah, uh, I mean, they're still doing other things in between. But you're right; they're not these major things. Um, next time we're going to talk about gambling, and gambling was a pretty big deal. But even there. The mob, as much as they were involved in it, there were a lot of other non-mob guys involved in it. So it didn't always point back to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you may be exactly right. Maybe it's as simple as just, you know, prohibition mob, obviously. Yeah. And, and it, Vegas mob. Well, and prohibition is where their alcohol thing 
hit its peak. Yeah. And then Joe Valone comes in after Prohibition and he kind of, well, I guess he, you said he was there two years before, but Prohibition yeah. is pretty much over. He's trying to hold on to Prohibi- to the alcohol thing and it's just dying underneath him. Yeah. And then maybe the next guy comes in and he starts the c- gambling thing, but it doesn't hit its peak until Frank Bellastrieri is there. And mm-hmm. that, then Frank Bellastrieri gets all the publicity for that phase of the mafia. That's that's fair. That's you know. fair. Um, and there's different there's there's enforcement differences. I mean, well, next time we're going to talk about gambling in the 30s and 40s. And on that in that that point it's it's state and local. It doesn't become a federal crime until 1961. So, for whatever reason, federal crimes get bigger headlines than local crimes do. Even though what you're doing is really no worse most of the time, the guys busted for federal gambling are doing the same crap that they were doing when they were busted locally. So it's not like, the, like oh my God, federal gamblers, so much worse. No, it's the same exact guys. But but it's just, it gets more. But, fed, but federal, like that's, that's a big flag where people are like, oh my goodness, the FBI is in here. So I, got, I'm, I guess I'm stupid. Is, is it still federally illegal to gamble today? Yeah. So it's not so, very well enforced anymore. Okay, so it's it's kind of just it, the same thing. Vegas has gambling because they just choose to ignore the federal law, basically. Uh so <laughs> so Vegas usually was okay because oh, this is this is a whole rabbit hole here. But but the gambling laws, the federal gambling laws, came in a way a lot of federal laws come in, and they play off this idea of interstate commerce which is kind of this BS thing that Congress uses to make federal laws. They're like, oh, you're doing something that affects interstate commerce. Therefore, we can regulate it. But like, it's a cop out because everything affects interstate commerce. Uh-huh. But as far as the gambling goes, like if you are local, like if you and your buddies are playing poker or whatever, that's fine. Like, maybe there's state laws against it, but the feds don't care. Or there's horse racing tracks. If you show up at the horse racing tracks and you place a bet, the feds don't care. That's fine. It's The problems they have is, like, when you're calling your bookie. Like, if you live in Milwaukee and you call your bookie in Vegas, that's illegal. Because now you are in another state getting wagering information from a second state. Don't ask me why that's worse. (laughs) I don't know. But that's the way the federal laws work. Okay, so it's in that situation, it is literally only if it crosses state lines. It is. That it, it otherwise, is. they don't care. It's interesting. Right. So, like, if the, with the Vegas casinos, the feds didn't care about that. But if they found out that the gamblers in Vegas were getting their wagering information, their odds on whatever they were gambling on from outside of Nevada then they could get in trouble for that. And they did. And and if they were taking bets yeah. from outside of the state of Nevada, it right. would be extremely illegal as well. Right. Gotcha. But if you just showed up and you play roulette or blackjack or something, it's a contained thing. It's not the federal government's problem, the way they look at it. See, I never knew that. That's super interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so everybody got like a little gambling lesson here. Well, but that's, that's how federal... This is the thing that's so stupid because... We didn't really talk about it too much. It's come up a little bit, but but there's there's a law that's still on the books, but it's never really enforced, um, called the Mann Act, or sometimes the White Slave Traffic Act, okay? Mm-hmm. Which is, you can't bring women or minors over the state lines for immoral purposes. And you can take that however you want to take that. Okay. But you, you, know, what it, you know what it means. Mm-hmm. And so it's funny. So like... Back in the day, if you were in Milwaukee and you took your girlfriend to Chicago for the weekend and the government could prove that you guys were in a hotel together and, you know, doing whatever you're doing in that hotel, you broke the law. But if you lived in Milwaukee and you drove hours and hours and hours up to Superior, Wisconsin, went in a hotel and did whatever, you you didn't break the law because you didn't cross the state line. So it's that, that some so some stupid things like the the feds will get involved once it's a multi-state jurisdiction. So it's like and and this is why 
like one of the big places that got busted for prostitution was Hurley, Hurley, Wisconsin. Um, one, because Hurley had a lot of prostitution. But the other reason being is they're right on the Those, border with Ironwood. So that people were crossing and yeah. doing this. So and- like almost anybody was crossing the line on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So the feds were like, well, we're regulating it now. Whereas if you were in Wausau, you know, you're probably not crossing the state yeah, line you got to travel often. five hours or yeah. something like that to get to a state line, so it's pretty safe. So it's a really weird thing. Like, like you could do the exact same thing in two different places, but just because of where you are, you could end up in federal prison for it. It's it's so weird the way the laws are set up. This, like, is, this is a big tangent from our topic today, but just it's I find that really interesting the way that it's set up. Yeah, that is... That is crazy, but that's, you know, the federal government, they want to be able to say you can't do this. And that's the only way they can do it because they can't really force a state to right. say you can't do something. Right. They, they they're can, not supposed to, they're not supposed to make laws well, for states. Yeah, yeah. They, they do things to coerce states to do things, yeah. but but they can't actually make a law that requires the state right, to exactly. allow or disallow something. So it's interesting. All right. So you got anything else for this episode? No, that's everything. Just uh, just want to, again, remind people that next week, it's gambling, and it's a coherent story. (laughs) So uh, if this one didn't, I think it went pretty well, but if you didn't follow it as great as as you could have, next week is better. I mean, it's actually going to be one one thing beginning to end. Super cool. All right. Well, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, We'll be back next week. Gavin, you got some contact info for him? Sure. Uh, you can go to milwaukeemafia.com. That's our fancy website. You can email me at milwaukeemafia at gmail.com. Uh, you can go to Facebook. And if you type in Gavin Schmidt, which is S-C-H-M-I-T-T, uh, you'll either find me or you'll find the Canadian volleyball player. I am not Canadian, and I don't usually play volleyball. So that's not me. <laughs> But uh, the other one who's not playing volleyball and it's profile pitcher, it's probably me. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, As always, leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. And just a reminder, I believe following this episode, we are going to switch to you will not see another one for every other week starting Mm -hmm. in this episode. And you should see the Patreon. We'll update once that is officially up, but but in the next episode, we should have that up and available for people to subscribe to. So please consider. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. And we'll see you next in two weeks. Well, next week or two weeks. weeks. <laughs> All right. Have Thank you. Ahead. Thanks for tuning in to the Milwaukee Mafia podcast. Join us next week for another look back at Wisconsin Mafia and true crime history. <laughs>